Welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. Thanks for tuning in to another episode this week. This one is a fun one. This is with a friend of mine, Natalia Nidham. She has actually been on the podcast before, and we kind of go back to that and start talking about in the beginning of biohacking and what it kind of looked like and this whole industry and yeah, it's just interesting having somebody come back on the podcast a couple years later. I think she was honestly one of my first 50 episodes, I want to say. So it was definitely a couple years ago that she was on the podcast. And today we talk about bioregulators and peptides and what those are. A lot of people might be confused by them and they're there's kind of some misinformation about them. So we kind of get into that. We get into Ozempic and what Ozempic is and why it works and how it works and the side effects and who's it for and who shouldn't take it. We also talk about bioregulators for women's health and what does that look like and what are the opportunities there. We talk about a wide variety of things, where we think the industry is going and further things in that space. So this was a great episode catching up with a friend. She I met her in person at the biohacking conference in June this year, which was wonderful. Unfortunately, I won't be at the conference next year due to plans that I already have. However, I will try to go to the one the year after. However, you know, for everyone who's in the biohacking space deeply as much as, you know, I might be, apparently the Keto Con, which is now Hack Your Health Summit, is on the same weekend as the Biohacking Conference. So this will be very interesting to see who goes where, what speakers speak at each one, where are the exhibitors. I, I'm curious to kind of just watch it from far away and see how it plays out. You know, I actually got invited already to KetoCon, which is now Hack Your Health. They sent me an invite, you know, to do some like promo work with them and being an affiliate and stuff. However, like I said, like I won't be able to go. I think it's in, I think it's in June. Yeah. So I I won't be able to go, but I, I'm curious to kind of see how it plays out and see where everyone goes. Because if you didn't listen to my review of the biohacking conference, go for it. It's a little spicy, but there were some really prominent people who were missing from the biohacking conference this year. And I was a little, I was a little disappointed by that, to be honest. There's some big names in the biohacking world who I would really like to see more and they were not there. So not that it's all about like those important people. It's just interesting when I just have to think like, why did that person choose not to go when they've gone other years? And so I'm curious to see where they go this year. People like, you know, Ben Greenfield or Luke Story or just other prominent people in the space. So I'm curious this year, state well next year, stay tuned for that. And if you are going to go, let me know how it is because I'd love to go. I know there was the Dragonfly conference that just happened last week. I was not able to go to that either. I'm not traveling right now. And so I heard that was pretty good. I know there were a lot of women there, a lot of female biohackers, which is great. And then there was also the online women's biohacking summit in September. And I think that one went well as well. And then there's some in the UK, like there's the health optimization summit. I think that's in September next year. And I think that might be it. I might be missing one. Yeah, there might be, there might be one that I'm missing, but I do think you should go to these if you can. There's something really magical about them and like really cool to meet people in person. Anyway, enough about that. Enjoy this episode with Nat. Please check out her podcast and follow her on socials and follow me on socials as well. I'm on Instagram at biohacking Brittany and TikTok at biohacking. If you want to connect there, I would love that. I spend a lot of my time there and that's kind of my prominent space. And then obviously I have this podcast and newsletter and things like that. And if you haven't checked out my new website, seriously do it. Do it. 
It is so nice. I'm so <laughs> I'm so happy about it and I'm so proud of it. It's really done really well. So enjoy this episode and a shout out to Bioptimizers. I talk about Bioptimizers a lot, okay? And honestly, they are one of my favorite brands. If you're looking for a magnesium, digestive enzymes, probiotic, sleep aid, they are who you want to go to. Now, they're having a massive Black Friday sale all month. So if you need any of those things, if you need, they also have a product that's like specifically made for gluten. So if you're like struggling to digest gluten, you can take this when you eat gluten and it, it will decrease the negative side effects on your body. I think it's called Gluten Guardian. I have that one and I really, really recommend it. But if you are going to ever buy it, I would buy it this month because they have the biggest sale going on possible right now. So use the link in my description or in my show notes. Use my discount code BiohackingBrittany. It actually gets you off more than what's on the website right now. Yeah, that's right. You get the most amount off, okay? So I'm all about you trying new biohacking tech and supplements and being able to save your hard-earned money at the same time. And a shout out to AG1, you know, the OGs in this space of green supplements. They have, man, they're everywhere. I, I don't even know what to say about them. They are everywhere. You know, you know, they're big when your family members are asking for them for Christmas. That's, that's how you know the company is really big and popular. There are over 75 different nutrients in their powder. I have it all of the time at least once a day. And I really prioritize it, especially when I'm traveling or when I'm not feeling well. It's one of those things that you can take that is very much covers your bases. So if you can't take anything else, if you're not stomaching supplements right now for whatever reason, if you're traveling, if you don't have space to bring all of your bottles or something like that, you can take AG1, add a scoop of it to your water, and then you're good to go. So definitely check that out. If you use my link in the description, you get a year supply of vitamin D3 and vitamin K2, which means you don't have to buy that yourself because we all we all should be on vitamin D, all of us. I don't care where you live, unless you are in, gosh, like you got to be in like Florida or somewhere like Central America, something like that. If you're in Canada anywhere <laughs> or Northern US, you definitely need to be on a vitamin D. So that is what you get if you use that link. So I always suggest you do so. And last but not least, check out my Amazon page. I have all of my favorite things linked there. I actually just linked the treadmill that I got. So I got this walking pad for underneath my desk and I use it for about 90 minutes to two hours a day when I'm working. It goes very, very slow very slow. And it allows me to increase my steps, burn some calories, get the metabolism going. So I'm not sitting all day. Okay. I work from home. It's so easy to be sitting all day. And so I wanted to get my body moving more. I got this walking pad. It's phenomenal. It's pretty quiet. I wear running shoes, like indoor shoes when I use it. And it is, gosh, I think it's like 300 bucks. I got, I got one of the cheapest ones possible because I did not want to spend a lot on it because I know it's going to be one of those things that I use off and on for the next few years. So definitely check that out. I'm, I bet you it's going to go on sale this weekend because Amazon does Black Friday as well, right? So check that out. Linked on my website, biohackingbrittany.com. Thank you for listening. Enjoy this episode and I will catch you next week for another one. Welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. Thank you for joining us for another episode today. We are diving into health optimization as usual, and I am joined by Natalie Nidham, who has actually been on this podcast before, like a very long time ago, back in the early days. And she is passionate about science. She is a certified holistic nutritionist and a epigenetic coach. So today we're going to dive into peptides and bioregulators and kind of a bit more nuanced biohacking things that I don't always typically talk about. So Nat, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Brittany. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So since we last had you on a couple of years ago, what has kind of changed in your health journey? 
like since let's say 2020, what's new for you? What have you been up to? What's what comes to mind? Wow. Everything. (laughs) I mean, everything and nothing, right? I mean, it's, it's, I mean, obviously there's new compounds out. There's, you know, there's a lot more in the space in the world of things like spermidine or, you know, different types of compounds. I've gotten much more deeply into the space of the bioregulators. I don't think in 2020, I was talking about those very much. And, you know, the the landscape of peptides is ever shifting these days. So definitely there's a lot has, has moved around, but in terms of my personal, my personal health journey, if you will, it's, I guess maybe I'm, I'm moving into a world where, and I feel like the, this biohacking space is kind of as a whole doing this, where we're starting to kind of come back home a little bit. You know, like we're, we're still super happy and excited about tech and supplements and, you know, all these different things, but this, this re-entrenchment into the importance of the basics, like the sleep, the stress management, the, the eating the right foods, fasting properly and not too much, the, you know, using things like cold exposure and heat, like sauna properly, like things that are almost old is, are becoming new again. And this whole idea of, you know, reconnecting with nature and community, like all these things are just getting talked about more and more. I, you know, I've just scheduled a couple of more podcasts for the, until the end of the year. And two of them are talking, are people who talk about the impact of, of emotions and old traumas on people's ability to heal and get better, never mind li- live longer, healthier lives. So I just, I feel like we're, we're, we're turning around a little bit and at a time where there's so much going on in the regenerative space, right? When it comes to stem cells and exosomes and very small stem cells and all these advanced strategies and yet a recognition that if we haven't done the basics and done the work, even those things kind of, you know, they can't save you. Yeah. I love that. I love that we're kind of like circling back to these foundational things that you have to have in place. Why do you think that shift has happened? Like, you know, technology and like you're saying, longevity and the space that we're in is only advanced in the last few years. So why do you think people are kind of shifting, almost like taking a step back? I think it's because they're realizing that, you know, if you're, if somebody's super inflamed, for example, they, they're, they've got rampant inflammation. If they haven't addressed that inflammation, even like sometimes you're kind of wasting your money, right? If you're not sleeping or you're in a constant sta- sympathetic state where your your body thinks you're under attack at all times, the, the tragedy is even these advanced techniques sometimes aren't enough to move the needle. So, which isn't to say that someone who's caught in a constant state of fight or flight where they, you know, they're, they're in this very heightened alert state, there's a technique called, I think it's called a ganglion block where they do an injection. I I think it's even Botox maybe, but they do an injection into the, the vagus nerve and that can help people that are completely stuck in that sympathetic state. Sometimes it can help, it can be dramatically efficient effective, but it's, that's almost like a last resort, right? You're going to, there's a lot of other things you can, I I think it's a stellar ganglion block is the name of that procedure. So it's just, it's just hopefully helping people to, before they get to that stage where they're so stuck that only the most extreme strategies is going to help them out. I think it's a recognition that, Hey, there's a lot we can do from a foundational basis that maybe we've forgotten about in the excitement of rushing to the next cool thing that we need to turn back towards and really pay attention to. I agree with that. I think it's kind of nice to to take a step back and check on these foundational things. And no matter what, you know, supplement or cool new tech that you might be into, if these foundational things aren't in place and you're not working on them, you know, daily or weekly, it's not really going to move the needle that much. Like if you're not sleeping well or you're super stressed or you're not exercising or anything like that, like it doesn't matter if you take this brand new cool longevity supplement, it's not going to do anything. (laughs) Like it's, you know, and it's, 
it's nice that people are care about foundations again, because so much of what we've been through has been, let's just do this quick fix. So I don't have to think about it. Let me pop this pill and let me be done with it. You know? Yeah, no, definitely. We're always, I mean, humanity as a rule have this, has this little flaw. We're always looking for the shortcut or the silver bullet. And, and definitely there's stuff that's come out that, that has come pretty close over the last couple of years. And still, you still have to do the work. You still have to, you know, but when it comes to dealing with stress, I don't want to be flippant about it. It's not, for some people, it's just not that easy. And so maybe sometimes one of the things that, you know, the emergence of, for example, psychedelic therapies in helping people overcome deep trauma or extreme stress you could call that something new. Maybe it's something that's been around for a long time and, you know, maybe with shamans and stuff like that, but it's now becoming more, it's, it's bubbling up into the mainstream a little bit as people are understanding that there's a place for ketamine therapy or psilocybin therapy or, and that kind of stuff. So I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping in an optimistic way that the world is, learning a little bit more about nuance and context, and we don't have to be so black and white about stuff. Yeah, I love that. So when you're working with your clients one-on-one, is this kind of the philosophy and theory that you go through with them is like, let's just check on your foundations before we even talk about peptides? Yeah. Yeah. No. And then much to people's chagrin, right? <laughs> you know, they, they walk in the door and I go, all right, what peptides are we going to use? And I'm like, none. What? What do you mean? (laughs) And and sit there and say, look, you know, before, first of all, like, why do you think you need peptides? I I don't think that peptides are, it's not like just, I'm going to have an apple today. You know, peptides to begin with are getting, it's getting really gray in the world about whether they're, you know, how easy they are to get and where you're going to get them. And, and, you know, from a regulation perspective, it's just getting worse and worse. So, that's that's something to think about but more importantly i think that you know people hear about peptides and and admittedly and for good reason they get really excited about the potential that they offer but again like you have to understand number one why you're using it and you know what is it that you're what's your what's the desired outcome what is it that's that you think needs to be influenced like what what pathway are you trying to influence and then have you done everything else to kind of prepare the terrain or clear the way for the peptide to be able to come in. You know, one expression that, that I learned from one of my teachers early on is you can't optimize someone who's not in a homeostatic state, right? Which basically means we need to help. If we want to be, you know, if we want to be superhuman for lack of a better word, you know, if we want to optimize and be better, then first we have to be in balance. Because if you're out of balance, it's just really hard to be above the line amazing before you've addressed, gotten yourself back into a state of balance. And and when people try to, you know, do all these these advanced things and they've got, I don't know, they've got a mold issue or they've got underlying heavy metals and stuff like that, very often, as you said earlier, they're just not going to be able to move the needle. Yeah. I mean, it's hard because like these companies, even peptide companies with this idea of it being a quick fix, it's such a sexy marketing scheme, you know, like I, I want to buy this cause it's going to solve all my problems. But at the same time, am I willing to actually do the work to set up my body to be balanced, to be able to accept that new thing that I'm doing? So if someone's listening to this and they're like, okay, yeah, I, I hear you. I get what you're saying. How does somebody know if they're actually truly in balance? And are we ever actually truly in balance? Or is it just kind of when you zoom out week after week, things kind of balance out? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I don't think we're ever truly in balance. I mean, you know, we're human health is a is a fluid state, right? So obviously, like when it comes, for example, like if let's say we're talking about a, pe- a supplement like a, an oral BPC-157 for gut health. The cool thing about this peptide is that it can often help people to feel better even before they've done all the work, 
right? What what I what I think I'm I'm saying also is for with something like that, let's say you're trying to address gut health and it comes to pass that for this particular issue BPC1 like BPC157 capsules might be helpful. We can start with the BPC157 as we're also cleaning up the diet, making sure that people aren't stressed when they're eating, that they're eating the right foods that, you know, so, so there can be a little bit of a side by side thing going on here. Or, you know, if someone is using BPC-157 to, to address musculoskeletal injuries, for example, obviously you're, you're, you're starting the peptide before you're in balance, you have an injury, like you're, you're out of balance. But I guess what, what I'm saying is the nuance there is if you have knee pain or shoulder pain, are you also looking at any underlying biomechanics that are, uh, that are causing that pain? Right. Is that, does that make sense? So that, yeah, because what the BPC, what the peptide might be able to help is reducing inflammation, reducing pain, helping the healing of the tissues. But if there's a subluxation in the joint or there's, or there's something that's out of place, which is, you know, kind of in the realm of chiropractic and osteopathy and stuff, if there's something that's out of place and that, and that doesn't get addressed or there's an imbalance between two opposing muscle groups, again, that has to be addressed at least at the same time so that what what the BPC what the peptide is doing is initiating healing, but it, but that's only going to really work and stick if you've also addressed the other pieces of it. No, that makes that makes perfect sense, and I'm glad you explained it like that. Like it can be both ways, and ideally we're working on both, right? Like ideally we are taking the peptide and we are working on these foundational things to bring balance into the body. I I'm super curious about your take on peptides for women's health specifically. So most of my listeners are women and, you know, we can definitely talk about menopause in a second, but I'm curious in terms of things like fertility, all of the PCOS girlies listening, endometriosis, things like that. What role can peptides really do? Like how can they help or can they even help in those chronics like honestly, really traumatic issues that a lot of women are facing? Yeah, it's a great question. And I'm not an expert in that area. That's not really my zone of genius, as it were. But what I would say is for hormonal imbalances, it's generally not a peptide problem. Like I don't feel, you know, when it comes to, if we're looking at the bioregulators, which is a subset of peptides, there might be a role there. And I can explain what the bioregulators are and how they're different in a second. But I haven't seen, I mean, there are, there is a peptide called kispeptin that can be used to help with LH and FSH levels. And I, I have heard in the, my community of people where it's helped, but usually it's because they're working with a physician and they're using it very strategically. But I would say that I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of the peptides. It's just, I don't feel like it would be the first place to go. I think that looking at hormones, optimizing hormones, balancing hormones, you know, looking at the gut, the microbiome, like all those things, obviously looking at stress levels and what can be done to help a person, you know, it it becomes such a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? where someone is trying to conceive so hard and it it's just it's it's one of the most heartbreaking and stressful situations which stress begets stress kind of thing right so i think that there's so many other things that that can be looked at first and and then where i've seen a category of peptides maybe be helpful is kind of on the um on the bioregulator side sometimes yeah no that that makes sense i feel like Peptides would be great for potentially supporting the root causes or associated issues with women's health issues. So like inflammation, gut health issues, like things like that, like exactly what you're saying versus, you know, balancing the female hormones directly or working on the ovaries directly. So I I do think they have a play or, or like a space, but it might be a roundabout way of supporting the issue versus like this will directly fix this one thing. 
All right. I know that so many of us struggle with our hormones. We have a lot of confusion around our menstrual cycles, ovulation, having our periods, regulating it, and really just minimizing the symptoms that we often deal with. I have been there. I've had a mild PCOS diagnosis. I have had irregular cycles since I've been off birth control. I've had a ovarian cyst. And honestly, I've been through a lot when it comes to hormones in the last few years. So out of that, I really taught myself about cycle syncing. And this is the idea that during different phases of the cycle, we are doing different things. We are eating different foods, taking different supplements or drinking different teas for the nutrients, exercising differently in response to where our hormones are at at that time. And through living in this ebb and flow of our cycle, we can actually feel better. We can look better. Our hormones are happier. We're mentally better. We can sleep better. And this is exactly what I found. So I took everything that I did. I put it into an easy peasy guide for you. It's called the Ebb and Flow Cycle Guide. It's on my website. Go and grab it right now. This is literally going to solve all of your hormone issues. I'm not kidding. It's So, so good. And it's so easy to read as well. I also added in a part about seed cycling because I know so many of you are interested in seed cycling as well. So that means what seeds do we take during which phase of the cycle? These seeds have different phytonutrients in it that can help with the different hormones during the different phases. And I've also included over 30 recipes that are super tasty as a bonus. So These recipes are designed for the different phases. So you can have certain ones during your period, during ovulation and things like that. And of course, I included biohacks. I included which biohacks to do around ovulation to optimize that, how to optimize your menstrual cycle or your menstruation during your period and everything like that. Everything from castor oil packs to acupuncture to red light therapy, to healing baths that that I love. That is what I did. So this is my ebb and flow cycle guide. You can grab it on my website right now, biohackingbrittany.com. Go for it. And I hope you really enjoy it. There's been over 500 that have been bought already, which is so amazing to see. And I'm just so thankful that I get to help women with their hormones and on their health journey. Yeah. No, I 100% agree. You know, when it, when we look at the bioregulators, you do have bioregulators for, there's the bioregulator for the pineal gland, for example, which has kind of a global endocrine balancing effect. And it helps balance circadian rhythm and it normalizes melatonin production, like things like that. And I've seen that bioregulator paired with the ovarian bioregulator. And I've definitely witnessed young women in some cases get their cycles back when they lost them. Doesn't always work that way. I'm, I just want to say that like I've, I'm, but I've definitely, you know, in the communities that people spontaneously posted like, holy cow, you know, here I've tried everything and I've done a few months, a few cycles of these two bioregulators and my cycle's back. I love that. I would love to dive into bioregulators because I don't think a lot of people know what they are. Can you explain them to us and the history of them? Because if I remember, I looked in, I looked into them last year. I think they're from Russia. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) I mean, mean, they were all the research and, and all the, 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 the biggest knowledge base comes out of Russia, right? The guy who is the granddaddy of bioregulator peptides is a gentleman by the name of Vladimir Kavinson. His He's Professor Vladimir Kavinson. He heads up the St. Petersburg Institute of Bioregulation and Gerontology. And he's got like 20,000 other titles in Russia. But 40 years ago, he was approached by Russian military. He was a young doctor in the military and his mission was figure out a way (laughs) to heal our soldiers that are coming back from space missions and nuclear submarines completely depleted age before their time. Like these guys were a mess coming back. And basically they kind of sent him on this mission that indirectly was how do we reverse aging? How do we stop aging? How do we help to repair the body? And so he came across these tiny little proteins 
that are just two to four amino acids long. So an amino acid is a building block of protein. And most peptides are, you know, anywhere from, from three to five, three to 50 amino acids long, but bioregulators are at most four amino acids and of course, minimum of two. So they're the teeniest of the, of proteins and they have the ability to get across the cell membrane. They have, they can get into the nucleus of the cell and there they will, they will bind to specific sites on DNA. And in doing so, they essentially trigger the expression of genes, which produces proteins that can help to restore function and rejuvenate whatever that tissue or gland or organ might be. And where they come from, which is actually also really interesting, where they originate from, so we make them in our bodies, ourselves, our microbiome makes some, our body makes some, we make less as we age. And I'm sure that stress and illness also kind of disables that system a little bit. And where they were sourced for therapeutic purposes in terms of reintroducing them into the humans was from young animals. So they would take an extract from pineal glands or from heart or from liver or lungs or thymus gland or thyroid gland or adrenal gland. And and if you're listening to this and you're in this space, you're like, well, wait, how is that different than desiccated adrenal? Like these desiccated organ supplements. And it's not that different. It's just more purified. Like it's distilled down to, to more of its that core element, which is the bioregulator peptide. Yeah. I was literally just thinking that like orthomolecular medicine, which is exactly like you said, basically you can take glands as a supplement that have been from an animal and they can support the glands in your body, which are actually kind of hard to find in Canada, to be honest. You know, there's, there's certain ones that are easy. I think I was on an adrenal one once upon a time. And then I looked for a thyroid one for my husband and there was none in Canada. So anyway, that's a different conversation. A different yeah. conversation. Yeah. This is old medicine, right? Like think yeah. about this. This is old medicine. You treat like with like, right? In a in an indigenous community, you would you would read about, oh, if a person has a heart problem, they would feed them heart. And if they have an immune problem, they might feed them thymus, which I think are I think thymus is sweetbreads. Maybe that's adrenals. But you know, there are there's in history, if you go to Weston A. Price stuff, like you will find a lot of justification for eating organs. And, and in many ways, what we're accessing when we're eating organ meats is these bioregulators, not to mention a whole bunch of cofactors that are in there. Would you say that, I mean, obviously this is super ethical and super not possible for a lot of people, but if you were able to eat the organ versus taking the bioregulator of it, would it be better and more efficient in the body to eat the organ? Mm, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I think the tricky thing is that you can only eat so much liver, right? And when you're taking the liver bioregulator, for example, you're really just accessing that amino acid sequence that triggers that, that regeneration in your own liver. And so it's possible that maybe you wouldn't need to eat that much liver to get the healing in your liver right? Like if you go to the websites of like ancestral supplements or heart and soil, like these guys that are making these desiccated organ supplements, you're going to read like crazy testimonials from people who've had totally transformational impact from e using those supplements. And I really believe that in part, it's the bioregulators that they're accessing on top of the other the other cofactors, it's just that you're not, first of all, you're not going to be able to go out and find pineal gland anywhere. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. To begin with. <laughs> and, and, and if you, even if you did, you might not enjoy sauteed pineal glands every night kind of yeah. thing. <laughs> um, but, but um, I think that I, I do think that the wisdom of eating organ meats is a thing. And it behooves us to include those organs that e A, we're able to access and B, we're willing to eat in our regular diet. You know, now these days you can go a lot of the better butcher shops. You can ask for a, 
they they have different names for it. Some guys will call it a paleo blend or butcher's blend. And what they'll do is they'll take mostly ground beef, but then 25% of that grind will actually be organs, right? I think I think there's a lot to be said for that. I love that. I I I need to do that here because I struggle eating organ meat on its own, but I do like the idea of like having ground liver within the beef patty of the burger I'm making or something like that. So that's a really good idea to ask the butcher to do it because it kind of like gets rid of the taste, which can be 100%. a little bad. Well, you know, you can make a great chili with one of those butcher blends and nobody would know. Yeah. Yeah, right? exactly. I it up and added all the stuff in it. it. People don't know, like maybe it tastes a little more earthy, but once you've added all your spices in there, it's just yummy. Hi there, folks. I've got some thrilling news to share with you. The Buy Optimizers Black Friday mega sale is in full swing. And guess what? It's actually not just for one day. It is for the entire month of November. This mega deal is available only for my listeners and only with my code. Yep, you heard me right. It's literally just for us. Now, you already know that I have an unwavering trust in Buy Optimizers. These guys are the real deal when it comes to improving digestion. And let's not forget about their top of the line magnesium. It's truly the best on the market. Plus, they actually back up their products with a rock solid 365 day money back guarantee. No questions asked. Now is the time of year when you fill up your shopping carts and stock up on Buy Optimizers goodness. Trust me when I say this, you won't be able to find a better Black Friday deal anywhere else, not even on the mighty Amazon. The biggest discount you can get and amazing gifts with purchases are available only on my page, bioptimizers.com slash biohackingbrittany with code biohackingbrittany. We all have those never ending Black Friday wish lists, but this year I challenge you to put your health at the top of that list. Instead of those impulsive purchases, let's focus on what really matters. So why wait? Choose health over unnecessary things this Black Friday. Head over to bioptimizers.com slash biohackingbrittany and enter my code biohackingbrittany at checkout. Let me know what you think of it and don't miss out on this mega deal for my listeners only. I feel like this is the type of thing that I'll do when I'm a mom one day and I won't tell anybody <laughs> in the family. <laughs> I've done it because they don't need to know. What do you mean? Like, oh, it's just how it tastes. I don't know. Like, yeah, a hundred percent. Well, and I mean, liver definitely has that kind of taste of earth, right? And that's, I mean, I have a son, my kid like will eat anything except for beets and liver. Those are the two things he draws the line on. And, but I've snuck liver into meatballs. I've snuck it into, into chili, into all kinds of stuff. And he, and, and, you know, he's 23 years old, so he'll laugh and say, well, you know what? It tastes good. I'll eat it anyway. But he's past that age of, oh my God, I'm not eating it if it's there. Just the principle. Yeah. I think, I think that's really smart. I, yeah, I just, I know how nutrient dense organ food and organ meats are. I am very much in the paleo world, tried to do Western A price for a little bit, had some success, but I've always kind of gone back to being paleo, but paleo definitely can include organ meat for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then I, again, like you, like I've looked at desiccated different types of glands. And I just want to make one note on that for people listening. If you are choosing to go that route, which I think is great, make sure you get a quality brand that the animals are actually treated well and are grass fed and grass finished organic, like everything to the nines, because those organs can store all sorts of things in them. And you're just taking that as a supplement. So really, really consider the source of where you're getting it from. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. And that is, that would be one of the advantages of the bioregulator peptide supplement, like the nutri the oral ones, because they're classified as nutritional supplements. And by the time they come to us, they don't look, they don't look like desiccated organs anymore. They just look like a white powder. So they've really refined it and really extracted the peptides and left out all the, a lot of the other stuff. So it, you have less, there's a little less of an issue there, but to your point, when you're taking those actual organ extracts and you just have to really be mindful of sourcing. Yeah. That's a really good point. It's more pure to take the individual 
peptides or bioregulators, like you're saying, versus taking the whole the whole organ. However, the whole organ, like you said, has the cofactors and coenzymes. And so it's more of a holistic approach. So it depends what you want to do. Do you have a certain brand of bioregulators that you can plug for people listening if they want to try them? Sure. So I get mine. I kind of go a little far afield. (laughs) I get mine from, from the UK, from a company called Profound Health. And if it's the, the website, it's profound-health.com. Actually, if you go, if you go to my website, natnidam.com, there's a nat recommend section and they're in there. And I like them from there because I, I trust those guys. There's, there's a lot of counterfeit in the world. Really? Wow. Well, there's counterfeit and everything, right? And apparently Russia is one of those places where there's a lot of it, but not to freak people out or anything. There's a couple of really good brands out there. And I would say that Found Health, I really trust. I love their stuff. And there's another, there, there's a few sites online. There's another one online called Cosmic Nootropics, and they also carry bioregulators. And they'll have both the Profound Health as well. They will have the natural kind of nutritional supplement, which is essentially a food-based product, if you will. But they will also carry the synthetic versions of the bioregulators. And so in the synthetic bioregulator, what's happened is they've identified that little two to four amino acid chain, and they, they're they able to resynthesize it in a lab. And so now it can be introduced into the body instead of eating it. You can basically use it as drops or sometimes a spray that you allow to dissolve under your tongue. And then your body absorb it, absorbs it through that it's very vascular membrane under the tongue and it goes straight into the bloodstream. And then the final way that the, that the synthetic bioregulator can be accessed is in, in us, in a form that can be injected subcutaneously. And unfortunately, epitalon, which is the pineal gland bioregulator, the synthetic version somehow, and I don't even know how it hit the radar, <laughs> somehow landed on that FDA list of peptides that is no longer, you know, no longer allowed to be, to be synthesized and sold by the compounding pharmacies in the US. It's, it's kind of odd that they, I mean, they picked that one, I think, because it's the most well-known and, and a lot of people know about it and use it. And it's, it's just interesting to me that they, they cherry picked that one and left all the other bioregulators off. Do you feel like the other ones will be like not approved as well by them soon? I don't know. You know, it's, it's, I, it's really, it's a bit, it's a bit, first of all, it's a bit sad what's going on. And especially with bioregulators that, you know, the, the ha- the real hallmark of the bioregulator is that for the most part, what it's trying to do is what we were talking about earlier is just bring the body back into balance. It, do- it you know, unlike desiccated thyroid, for example, that can take someone who's already hyperthyroid and push them into overdrive. The thyroid bioregulator will, will, can actually be used for someone who's either hyper or hypothyroid because it what it's driving is the system back into balance, back to homeostasis. And so for that reason, they've got a crazy kind of safety profile. And I I can't answer the question. I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm a little perplexed as to how Epitalon ended up on that list in the first place. I wouldn't have thought it was on their radar. Yeah, maybe too much noise around it and it eventually got to them. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Are there certain peptides or bioregulators, probably more peptides, that you think are great for longevity? Obviously, as you know, longevity has become such a hot topic in the, in the last couple of years. So I'm curious your thoughts around it and in relation to peptides. Yeah, well, so for me, it's more the bioregulators, ironically, than the peptides. I th- yeah, like I think of peptides more like they're they will help to drive repair or they will, you know, like a BPC-157 is going to drive repair. It's not particularly a longevity peptide, whereas something like Epitalon, the pineal gland bioregulator, if you think about it, it helps to it can help to activate telomerase. And telomerase is an enzyme that maintains telomeres. So it makes sure that the, your telomeres on the ends of your DNA don't get so short that your DNA is no longer able to replicate. It 
also helps to, you know, it normalize it it normalizes melatonin in older adults. So people over the age of 50, for example, where your melatonin is starting to drop off, what if it can restore those levels to that of a 30 or 40 year old? So I would say the pineal gland bioregulator is going to be, it's going to head the list of a longevity on the longevity front. And then you've got a bioregulator for you know, the thymus gland. So if you can revive the thymus gland or bring function back to that thymus gland and amp up immunity, that's going to be critical for longevity because that dysfunction, dysfunction in the immune system is ultimately what kills us down the road. So I, I, I actually see the bioregulators as being more of a factor when it comes to longevity than, than the, the peptides, which to me are more for fixing problems yeah, more like acute issues versus like long term health goals. Yeah, I yeah, I agree with that. That makes sense when you explain it like that. Do you think that I guess do you think most people should kind of be on some sort of bioregulator then? Like if they had access to it and it was more common, like would you love to see that? Or do you think there's like a time and place and maybe not every single person needs it? I think that based on the research that I've seen and the studies I've seen, most of us, if not all of us, could benefit from them, certainly as we get older, right? So I think that if you're 30 or 35 years old, you know, you could do a, a round, a couple of rounds of the immune and the pineal gland bioregulator once a couple times a year. And that would be great. But once you're starting to hit north of 40 or 45, there's probably an argument for doing some cycles and just kind of, it's almost like restoring the tread on your tires, right? There's regular wear and tear. And so would there be some benefit in triggering some repair and some regeneration on an organ by organ, system by system basis? And I would say that if people can afford it and it's, it's, something that they're interested in, there'd be some value in that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious about the effects of peptides or bioregulators on mental health. I see a lot of mental health discussions happening now, and I, and I think it's good. I think it's great that it's less of a taboo issue, whether it's anxiety, depression, PTSD, you know, trauma, whatever, you know, whatever flavor it is. I just... I wonder what role this could have because especially with a bioregulator, like what type of bioregulator could you even take for something like a mental health issue or is it just not meant for something like that? Yeah, I think for mental health, it wouldn't be my first stop, definitely. I think on the mental health side, you do, there you do have some peptides like CMAX and CLANC that are actually approved in places like Russia and certain countries in Europe for they're anxiolytic. They've got nootropic benefits. They've got some immune benefits, but they, but they're specifically can be helpful for people who are suffering from depression and, and anxiety, that kind of stuff in some cases. I mean, the tricky thing with mental health issues is they're so multi-layered and it's rarely just one thing. I think that, you know, other areas of, of health that are really starting to lean into this, this space and having a massive impact is things like my, the microbiome, which is, you know, which I'm sure you know, like the microbiome is being shown to have a massive impact on, on mental health, which folds into gut health. Vagal nerve tone is a big issue. And then when it comes to trauma, PTSD, stuff like that, I, again, like I, I feel like where we're really breaking ground there, especially for cases that are very tough, is things like psychedelic therapies and ketamine therapy, like psilocybin therapy, all within a therapeutic setting, obviously, and very controlled. But I feel like that's where some of the biggest inroads are being made. Oh, I totally agree with that. The In the last few years, to see how it's not mainstream, but how much more popular psilocybin has become in terms of helping mental health patients and people and supporting people in that space is phenomenal. And I know like I've had my own bouts of taking psilocybin over a course of a few months in conjunction with like talk therapy, like seeing a therapist. I don't do them at the same time, but 
there's something about that combination for mental health that is very, very powerful. And I've talked about psilocybin a lot on this podcast because I just think it's so, it changes the way your brain works. It creates new neural pathways. And that is fascinating because what else does that? Like it, it just blows my mind that it does that. And it can kind of connect the dots in a different way that you have not previously thought about. And so it just opens your eyes to different ways of thinking about what is actually causing the anxiety or depression. And that's kind of how you heal through it. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's, that's super interesting, right? And so CMAX and C-Lank, I can't remember if it's both, but one of them definitely drives BDNF. So that brain derived neurofactor. There's also another peptide called dihexa, which is really helpful in terms of building those new neural pathways. The trick is that, you know, with any of these things, and, and I think it's, it's interesting for you that you were doing the talk therapy and doing the psilocybin alongside it is that very often when we're, even when we're talking about these peptides for helping with cognition and stuff like that, is you have to be using your brain to build those new neural pathways, right? So it's almost like the peptide is the starter fluid or the fertilizer or the the food that's going to get it going, but then you also have to be initiating the need for it so that the body does kind of grow those new pathways. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, talk therapy is great because obviously you get to, it's just a chance for reflection. So now that your brain has started to think about your problems in a different way, then you get to talk it out loud and then really, really connect those dots and form those new neural pathways. So that makes a lot of sense. And that's, I guess, why so many people recommend doing both, you know, around the same time is because one is like the starter and the other is like the implementer. My next partner I want to talk about is Athletic Greens. So I take AG1 by Athletic Greens literally every single day. And I first gave AG1 a try when I was traveling to Costa Rica. I really wanted something to support my gut health, boost my energy, keep my immune system in check, and really just support me while I was traveling and not home. I quickly fell in love with it. And now that I'm back in Canada, I still take it every single day. And I take it in the morning before I have any type of coffee. Typically, it's like the first thing I have in the morning. And it makes me feel just fantastic. I feel like I'm starting my day off on the right foot. I feel like I'm covering all of my nutrition needs right from the get-go, which is super important and such a healthier way to start than just having coffee on an empty stomach right away. So I just, I'm just obsessed with taking it. And if you want to take ownership of your health, today is a good time to start. Athletic Greens is giving you a free, wow, one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. So those are the same travel packs that I took when I was flying. Go to athleticgreens.com slash biohacking with Brittany. That's athleticgreens.com slash biohacking with Brittany to check it out today. It's also linked in my show notes and on my website everywhere. Yeah, exactly. I think that's that's a great way to go about it. And I think that's where I, I think that therapy is moving faster in some ways for that reason, right? Because it kind of gets like t- talk therapy is all great, but at the end of the day, we've built walls, right? We build walls to protect ourselves, to protect our younger selves, to protect our beliefs and whatever the case may be. And having a tool that allows us to, you know, either maybe not even tear down the wall, but look behind the wall in a non-judgmental way that allows us to observe things and consider them without getting emotionally tangled up in it is a very powerful thing to be able to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree. Yeah. I honestly, I recommend talk therapy to everybody. It's interesting when I talk to a bit of like an older generation about it. Like, so for example, my in-laws, they are so, oh, I don't need to go. Why do I need that? Like, I, nothing's wrong, you know? And and then in my mind, I'm like, every single person needs therapy at one point in their life. Like, we all have our own traumas and issues and things that we're dealing with. And it's so healthy to have a safe space to talk about it. And it's honestly, it's really hard to navigate those conversations and try to convince somebody to try it when they're so in this, like, believe that taboo of it of like, 
oh, you've had to have something really bad happen to you in order to go see a therapist. But it's like, no, like, I don't know. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but it's something that I definitely uh, face in my personal life. Yeah. I mean, look, there's all kinds of people in the world and and certainly in older generations, it just, it just, it's just not a thing. Right. And for them, it, things are what they are and you deal with it and you move on kind of thing. But but I don't even know that it's an age thing so much anymore. I think it's just a mindset and it's, a, and to your point, it's a belief system. And, and the problem is that talk therapy or any kind of therapy is hard. You know, you have to be willing to face some truths and admit things and do some work and deal with unpleasant stuff that may come up that not everybody is, is in for. It's, it's easier to close the door and say, okay, well, what can I take? <laughs> what can I, what money can I throw at this problem to make it go away? Or they just like reach for the wine, you know, or like some sort of substance or even food even to like null and like, I guess dull is the word to dull how they're feeling. And it's, yeah, it's sad, but I, I hope people listening to this are encouraged to, to really look into things like peptides and therapy and just like all of these different ways that we can heal, right? Like, that's the beauty of biohacking and health optimization in general is it's not this one thing that you have to do. There's so many modalities and you get to play around and choose what works for you. And what works for you today might not work for you in a year. And that's like totally okay. And that's what we're all about. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think the, the, the creed of the biohacker is, or the, the, the real defining feature is curiosity. Mm, right is I love willing that. to be to be open and curious willing to be wrong <laughs> sometimes yeah and and be able to say oh well i really believe that and you just like we there's for every one thing that we know there's a thousand things we don't know so we have to be open to the fact that what we believe what we believe today based on what we know and that new information can come out tomorrow that's going to toss it all up in the air and spin it around the other way yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love that. Where do you think the health optimization world is headed in the next few years? Like, what do you think is coming in this space? Good question. I think that, um, well, I think that if we can get our peptides back, that's going to, they're going to be playing a big role in medicine. And, you know, we're, we've seen it with things like even Ozempic and Munjaro, like, however you feel about them those things are the closest thing to silver bullet status in the fat loss and type two diabetes treatment world that's come along ever. Uh, even though, you know, if for people to use them properly, they have to use them well, but those both are, those are peptides. They're based on natural substances that naturally occur in the body. And so look at how powerful they are. And I think tapping into the body and the secrets that the body is holding and seeing how we can, you know, re-engage it to, to get ourselves healthier is amazing. Some of the most fascinating regenerative strategies are tapping into stem cells, exosomes, VSELs, like very small stem cells. Like these things as scientists are, and researchers are getting their heads around how they work and how can we re-administer them to the body in strategic ways so that it it really just reignites the body's own mechanism of healing and regeneration. I, I think that's, to me, that's the most exciting stuff that's coming down the pipes. And in every day you talk to someone else and there's a new application of peptides or there's another growth factor or another little signaling molecule that they've identified that can be leveraged and, and used to do amazing things in the body. Yeah, I love that. I'm curious what natural molecule Ozempic is from. Oh, it's a GLP-1 agonist. Meaning? So so GLP-1 is a compound that you secrete in your gut when you eat. And, and it does all the things that Ozempic does, only it does it for 20 seconds or, you know, oh. like a minute. So what they've done is they've taken GLP-1 and they've extended its half-life into days. 
right? So it's a, it has that appetite suppressing effect. It slows gastric emptying. It improves insulin sensitivity. It, you know, it does all these amazing things, but it does them on a much longer basis. The, the problem is that if people, and you know, this is what we're seeing, people will use these things, they'll drop a bunch of weight, but they don't pay that much attention to what they're eating or they're not doing any exercise or they haven't changed their habits that's when you see people starting to really get into trouble. Yeah, because I heard that once you come off of Ozempic, like you typically just gain the weight right back. Well, you do if you didn't change your eating habits, if you sat on the couch and watched the weight come off and didn't build any muscle. I mean, if you think about it, your lean muscle mass is your greatest strategy for combating high blood sugar and for burning excess calories right? So the invitation to people really is while you're in this state where your food drive is, you know, food noise in your head has come down, you're not that excited about eating crappy food. You're not that excited about eating any food really, right? So if you can get yourself into a world where you relearn, re-educate your, your palate even to eating healthier foods, to eating protein first, and to exercising, like adopting better habits, and addressing the microbiome, right? And making sure that gut microbiome is working for you, then you can come off these things and and essentially be a better you, right? Because you were able to shut down all the noise. Now, is there a portion of the population that might have to be like from the morbidly obese world where things are so broken that they may need to be on these compounds for the long haul? Maybe I, you know, I'm, I'm not that well versed in that space, but I think for most people and especially people that are using these to, you know, to lose 20 pounds, 10 pounds, 30, you know, not, not a colossal amount of weight. There's a real opportunity here to just do the work and then be able to come off of them. And, you know, and we've got other, there's other supplements out there. There's, there's a company called Healthgevity that has a supplement called Ignite Plus that is an incredible stack of compounds that help to balance blood sugar, ramp up metabolism, ramp up fat burning. So maybe people come off the GLP-1 agonist and move into a world where for a time they might use a product like that to help them to keep balanced. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. That makes a lot of sense. I it kind of goes back to what we we're saying of like you can take the Ozempic, but it's going to be more effective if you have your foundations in place. And then when you come off of it, you're going to have continued results if you are doing those things that are so pivotal to your health. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, I I I think like I mean what I said before, like it's kind of like a silver bullet because in many ways, people don't have to work that hard when they're on them to lose weight for the most part. But if you don't want to be dependent on it for the, till the end of your days and you want to be healthier and, and there's a lot about these, like I was talking to a doctor last weekend at the conference who was saying that she prescribes these things to her patients looking to be optimized for long-term health right? Because there's data on it being good for the brain, good for the heart, good for the kidneys. So she's using them at super low dose for her patients on an ongoing basis for the health benefits, not just for the fat loss. Nice. I love that. Yeah. I love looking at it from that lens because I just, yeah, I, I'm always curious about these like short-term hacks for like certain issues, but like, what does it mean for our long-term health? I think is so important. And we, and we do need to be considering that, you know, like we can't just toss it under the rug and deal with it in five years. <laughs> like, yeah, well, we all see how that, that rarely ends well. Right? Yes. So. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for coming on my podcast again. I would love for you to plug where people can connect with you, potentially work with you and maybe take a look at the peptides and the bioregulators that you recommend. Thank you so much, Brittany. So the my podcast is the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. So that's where, you know, I host conversations like yours where, you know, we're just kind of diving into the things I'm super curious about. My website is probably the best way to keep track of most of what I do, and that's natnidham.com. And that's where you can sign up for my newsletter. I'm currently not taking any one-on-one coaching clients, but probably will 
kind of bring in a cohort at some point in the new year. So people who are signed up to my newsletter will be the first to know that. And then I also have a private membership group on Mighty Networks. And you can find the link for that on my website as well, which is the BSP community. Nice. I love that. My uh, my husband actually works for Mighty Networks. Oh, he does? Oh, I, I like that platform. I think it's kind of, it's such a refreshing alternative to the craziness of Facebook. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. So if you ever have any issues or need help, just send me a message and I'll tell him. No, I have some suggestions. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. He would, he would love to hear that. Yeah. Mighty Networks, just for everyone listening, is like a, it's basically not as regulated as Facebook. So there's a lot of communities on there where you can kind of have more freedom in what you're saying, which is why a lot of people like it. But you could host like a community, a course, a forum, like all types of different things. So it's really cool. Yeah. No. And and it's not like Facebook. Someone's always listening and watching, right? You have to watch what you say. You have to watch what you talk about, all the things. Whereas on Mighty Networks, I mean, if they're listening, they're very quiet because <laughs> I've never gotten any, you know, any warnings like I have on Facebook where, oh, if you use that word, we're going to shut down your group. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. They have way more problematic groups than yours. I've heard the stories. So don't even worry about it. Well, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And I will add all of those links to my show notes and my website so everyone can find you easily. Thank you so much, Brittany. This has been great. Thanks for listening to another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. If you're interested in finding the show notes or the sponsors for this episode, you can do so on my website, which is biohackingbrittany.com. Remember to follow me on Instagram where I'm most active. My handle is at biohackingbrittany. And if you're interested in working together and you want to email me directly, you can do that. My email is info at biohackingbrittany.com. And I look forward to hearing from you and having you tune in next week.